Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. A huge warm hello to all of you amazing viewers tuning in today. Seriously, thank you so much for clicking and joining me for another dive into the fascinating world around us. Before we get started, sending out the biggest virtual hugs and best wishes. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I truly hope you're feeling fantastic, full of energy, and staying healthy. Taking care of yourselves is the most important thing. Okay, let's satisfy some curiosity. Have you ever wondered what makes up the leaf of a plant, the skin on your hand, or even a tiny drop of pond water? What if I told you there's a whole universe teeming with incredible structures, completely invisible to our naked eye? That's right. Today, we're unlocking the secrets of the microscopic world and answering a fundamental question. How can you see cells under a microscope? Get ready because we're about to shrink down and explore the very building blocks of life itself. Seeing cells is all about overcoming a simple limitation. Our eyes just aren't powerful enough. Think about trying to see the details on a coin that's a mile away. Impossible, right? Cells are incredibly, mind-bogglingly small. Most are way smaller than the tiniest speck of dust you can see floating in a sunbeam. To put it in perspective, imagine the thickness of a single sheet of paper. Stack about a hundred of those sheets together. That thickness? That's roughly the size scale where many cells hang out. Our eyes, amazing as they are, just can't focus on anything that tiny. We need a special tool to gather more light from that tiny object and bend it, magnifying the image so our eyes can finally perceive it. That magical tool is the microscope. Think of it like a super-powered magnifying glass, but way more sophisticated. It works by using carefully shaped pieces of glass called lenses. These lenses capture the light bouncing off or passing through a super tiny object, like a cell, and they bend that light in a very specific way. This bending action spreads the light rays out, making the image of the tiny object appear much, much larger when it finally reaches your eye. It's like taking a tiny dot and stretching its picture out over a bigger area so you can see all the details hidden within it. The key thing a microscope does is provide magnification, making the small look big and resolution, allowing you to see fine details clearly, not just a big blur. The most common type of microscope you'll encounter, especially in schools or starting out, is called a compound light microscope. It's called compound because it uses two sets of lenses working together to magnify the image. The first set of lenses is really close to the tiny thing you're looking at, what we call the specimen. This set is called the objective lenses. These are the ones that do the heavy lifting of gathering the light and providing the initial powerful magnification. You usually have several objective lenses mounted on a rotating turret, each with a different power, like 4X, 10X, 40X, or even 100X. The X stands for times, so a 10X lens makes the object look 10 times bigger than its actual size. The higher the number, the closer you zoom in. Then, there's a second set of lenses that your eye actually looks through. This is called the eyepiece or ocular lens. The eyepiece usually magnifies the image another 10 times. So, the total magnification you see is the magnification of the objective lens multiplied by the magnification of the eyepiece. If you're using the 10x objective and a 10x eyepiece, you're seeing the object magnified 100 times. 10 times 10 is equal to 100. Switch to the 40x objective, and now you're at 400x magnification. That's getting down to the level where many cells become visible. But magnification alone isn't enough. You also need light. That's why compound light microscopes have a light source, usually a small lamp built into the base. This light shines upwards. Below the stage, that's the flat platform where you put your specimen. There's a condenser. The condenser isn't just a simple light. It's a special lens system that focuses the light into a bright, concentrated beam that passes through your specimen. This is crucial for seeing most biological cells clearly. The light travels up through the specimen, carrying information about its structure, where it's thicker, thinner, or stained, then through the objective lens, then the eyepiece, and finally into your eye. Adjusting the brightness of the light and the focus using the coarse and fine focus knobs are essential steps to getting a sharp, clear image. 
The coarse knob moves the stage up and down quickly for a rough focus, and the fine knob makes tiny, precise adjustments to get that perfect crisp view. It takes a bit of practice to get the hang of it, but it's worth it. Now, you can't just plop a leaf or a piece of your skin straight onto the microscope stage and expect to see cells clearly. Specimens need a little preparation. Imagine trying to look through a crumpled piece of paper. It's messy and uneven. For the light to pass through evenly and for the microscope to focus properly, the specimen usually needs to be very thin and flat. This is where microscope slides come in. A slide is a thin, flat rectangle of clear glass or plastic. You place your tiny piece of specimen onto the center of the slide. Often, especially if you're looking at something dry or something you want to preserve, you add a single drop of water or a special mounting medium onto the specimen first. Then, you gently lower a much smaller, thinner square of glass called a cover slip on top. You lower it at an angle to avoid trapping big air bubbles. This creates a sandwich slide on the bottom your specimen in the middle with its liquid, and the cover slip on top. This flattens the specimen, holds it perfectly still, and protects the delicate objective lenses from accidentally touching it. The cover slip also creates an even surface for the light to pass through. This whole setup is called a wet mount if you're using water or a temporary liquid. For things that need to be kept permanently or studied in more detail, scientists use more complex preparation techniques involving chemicals to preserve, fix, the cells, embed them in wax, slice them incredibly thinly, sections, and stain them. Ah, uh, staining. This is a super helpful trick, especially when you're first learning or looking at animal cells. Many cells and their internal parts are mostly transparent and colorless under a microscope. Imagine trying to see a clear glass marble against a clear glass table. Tricky. Stains are special dyes that are absorbed by different parts of the cell. Some stains stick to the nucleus, the cell's control center. Some stick to the cytoplasm, the jelly-like filling, and others might highlight specific structures. Common, safe stains for beginners include methylene blue, which often makes the nucleus a dark blue, or iodine solution, which can stain plant starch or highlight structures in onion cells. To stain a slide, you often add a drop or two of the stain next to the edge of the cover slip, then carefully draw it under by touching a piece of paper towel to the opposite edge. The stain flows under the cover slip and colors the cells, making all those invisible structures suddenly pop into view with contrasting colors. It's like turning on the lights inside the cell. Without stains, many cells just look like faint, ghostly blobs or outlines. Staining reveals the incredible complexity hidden inside. So, what are you actually likely to see? Let's start with something easy and amazing, plant cells. A classic beginner specimen is a thin layer of onion skin. It's super easy to peel off a very thin, almost transparent piece. You place it on a slide, add a drop of water or iodine, cover it, and pop it under the microscope. Start with the lowest power objective, like 4x or 10x, to find your specimen. It might look like a grid or a bunch of bricks. Once you find it and get it roughly focused with the coarse knob, switch to a higher power like 40x and use the fine focus knob. Suddenly, you'll see it clearly, a neat arrangement of box-like structures. Each of those boxes is a single plant cell. You'll see a thick outer boundary. That's the cell wall made of tough cellulose, giving the plant its structure and shape. Inside, you might see a large, clear space. That's the vacuole, a storage sack filled with water and other stuff, helping the cell stay plump. If you look carefully, often near the edges, you might spot a smaller, darker, roundish structure. That's the nucleus, the brain of the cell holding its DNA. If you use iodine, it might stain the nucleus a yellowish brown, making it easier to see. Sometimes, in other plant cells like Elodia, a common aquarium plant, you might even see tiny green discs floating around inside the cell. Those are chloroplasts, the amazing structures that capture sunlight to make food for the plant through photosynthesis. They might even be moving slowly, carried by the cytoplasm. Seeing plant cells is usually straightforward because their rigid cell walls make them easy to distinguish from one another. Seeing animal cells is a bit trickier because they don't have that rigid outer wall. A common first animal cell to observe is your own. 
Cheek cells are surprisingly easy to get. Gently scrape the inside of your cheek with the blunt end of a toothpick or a clean cotton swab. Don't dig hard, just a light scrape. You'll get some clear, gooey stuff that's mucus containing your cheek cells. Smear this gently onto the center of a clean slide. Add a single drop of methylene blue stain. Be careful, it stains skin and clothes. Then, carefully lower a cover slip on top. Now, under the microscope, again, start low power to find the smear, then go to 40x, you'll see a different picture. Instead of neat boxes, you'll see irregular, blob-like shapes scattered about. These are your cheek cells. They look flatter and less defined than plant cells. The methylene blue stain will likely make the nucleus stand out as a dark blue spot somewhere within the more lightly stained, pale blue cytoplasm. You won't see a distinct cell wall, just the outer boundary of the cell membrane. Animal cells are more delicate and flexible, which is why they don't hold that rigid box shape. Seeing the faint outline of your own cells is a pretty incredible moment. The fun doesn't stop there. Grab a drop of pond water or water from a flower vase, especially if it's a bit green. Put a tiny drop on a slide, add a cover slip gently and explore under the microscope. This is where the real safari begins. You might zoom in and see single-celled organisms zooming around erratically. Those could be protozoa like paramecium or amoeba. You might see algae, which could be single cells or chains of cells, often green from chlorophyll. You might even see tiny multicellular creatures like water fleas, daphnia, or hydra. Watching these tiny creatures move, feed, and interact in a single drop of water is mesmerizing and really drives home how much life exists unseen all around us. The microscope transforms that ordinary drop into a bustling miniature ecosystem. Learning to use a microscope well takes patience and practice. Always start with the lowest magnification objective. This gives you the widest field of view, making it much easier to find your specimen. Trying to find a tiny cell on high power right away is like trying to find a specific house by staring at one brick through a telescope, frustrating and nearly impossible. Once you find your specimen and get it centered in the field of view using the stage controls, those knobs that move the slide left slash right slash forward slash back, then you can carefully rotate the turret to switch to a higher power objective. Be careful. Higher power lenses are longer and can easily smash into the slide if you're not paying attention. Look from the side as you rotate the turret to make sure the lens doesn't hit the slide. When switching to high power, like 40x or 100x, you usually only need to use the fine focus knob for tiny adjustments. The coarse knob might move the stage too much. Controlling the light is also key. Too much light can wash out a thin specimen, making everything glare white. Too little light makes it hard to see any detail. Use the diaphragm, usually a dial under the stage, to adjust the size of the opening the light passes through, finding the perfect brightness and contrast for what you're looking at. And keep both eyes open. It feels weird at first, but it reduces eye strain. Just focus with the eye looking through the eyepiece. Seeing cells for the first time is a genuinely awe-inspiring moment. It connects you directly to the fundamental units that make up every living thing on Earth. The plants, the animals, and even yourself. That tiny box in the onion, that irregular blob from your cheek, that's where life happens. Inside each one are complex processes keeping the organism alive, growing, and functioning. The microscope isn't just a tool. It's a time machine taking us back to when Robert Hooke first looked at cork in the 1600s, saw those little rooms, and named them cells. It's a window into a hidden universe that exists parallel to our own, full of intricate structures and bustling activity. It reveals the incredible complexity and beauty packed into the tiniest spaces. Whether you're looking at the geometric perfection of a plant cell, the dynamic nucleus in your own cheek cell, or the frantic swimming of a microbe, it sparks a deep sense of wonder. It makes abstract concepts like life and biology suddenly tangible and real. You're not just hearing about cells, you're seeing them. That direct observation is powerful. So, if you ever get the chance to peer through a microscope, take it. Start simple, be patient, adjust the focus and light, and prepare to be amazed by the invisible world that's been right in front of you, or inside you, all along. Thanks so much for exploring this tiny giant world with me today. 
Keep looking closely, stay curious, and take care of yourselves. See you next time.